I have this wall clock that I found at the Goodwill and I'm just going to remove the back, taking the screws out, removing the hands and then that battery mechanism. Then I'm taking this fabric fat quarter that I found at Hobby Lobby with this adorable sunflower print on it. I'm going to open it up and then just cut out a square that's big enough to cover the front of that clock face. Then using my Cricut spatula, which I am still not sure what this thing is actually meant to be used for, but I am using it to remove this paper clock face from the cardboard. That way we have a nice clean surface to adhere our fabric to. And I'm taking my decoupage glue here, putting a nice layer down on top of the cardboard, adding my fabric, smoothing out all of the wrinkles, and then we are going to add another layer of the decoupage glue on top. And I do take the glue a little bit past the cardboard and the fabric so that once it dries, it becomes a little stiffer and easier to cut off the excess with your X-Acto knife. Next, we are moving on to the wooden part of the clock frame, and I'm going to take my Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white, and I gave this three coats of paint to make sure it was nice and covered and none of that wood was going to be peeking through. Once that dried, I'm taking a 220 grit sandpaper, and I'm lightly distressing all of the edges all of those like corners where there's a little detail at. I don't like heavy distressing, but feel free to distress a piece to whatever makes you happy. But I didn't really like how light the um, distressing looked and that wood tone that was peeking through underneath. So I took my black Sharpie, went over all of those distressing lines and then sanded that down a little bit as well to lighten it up and make it all look cohesive. Next, I forgot to hit record, but I just took some vinyl, cut out some numbers on my Cricut machine, and taking this Rust-Oleum metallic spray paint in the color rose gold, I spray painted both my vinyl cutout numbers and the clock hands. I wanted them to both match, but I didn't have a like rose gold colored vinyl and I wasn't really sure if spray painting the vinyl would work but it actually worked out perfectly. Next I'm going to add all of my numbers around the outside of the clock face this time rather than on the inside which is how it was when I bought it and I am using my Cricut weeding tool here to just kind of go over the outsides like outline the numbers before peeling them off of the vinyl backing. That way I don't peel up any of that excess spray paint with it. And I mostly eyeballed it here. Um, I used my L roller to make sure my six and my 12 were pretty lined up as best as I could get them. And then for the rest of the numbers, I just eyeballed it and spaced them out as evenly as I could. Once I had all of my numbers attached to the wooden frame, I'm taking my polyacrylic. I thought I grabbed matte here, but it actually looks a little shiny. So I may have grabbed my satin by accident, but I just wanna make sure that I seal in all of that vinyl and it's not going anywhere. Next, we can add everything back together. So I'm taking my little watch hands, putting them back on to the fabric front, screwing the back on to the frame. And I thought we were done here, guys, but as usual, something goes wrong. I made a mistake when I put the numbers on. I didn't pay attention to where this was going to hang up on the wall. So <laughs> here's my hanger right here, which if we hung it up would be totally sideways. So I already sealed this. I'm not taking the numbers off and I can't, even if I change the direction of this and put it up here, it's still like off. Like it would be, it would be like this, like the one would be more up top than the 12. So totally didn't pay attention to that. This is actually the bottom too. So I did it totally upside down. Like this is where the top should be right here, but it is what it is, it's fine. So we just had to come up with a creative solution for hanging this on the wall. 
So I have this, um, this is Dollar Tree leather ribbon and I just had glued two pieces together. I had this sitting a while out, sitting around for a while. I was going to use it on something else. Um, but I think I'm going to just use it on this so we can then hang up our clock facing the right direction. I added on that leather ribbon with my hot glue gun and that was it for this project. I absolutely love the way it turned out. I was a little upset by having to add that leather strap at first, but the more I look at it, I think it has that vintage old school pocket watch vibe and I absolutely love it. I just love these fuzzy little heart-shaped pillows and throw pillows are an easy way to add a touch of the holiday without going overboard. I took a trip to Joanne Fabrics to see what I could find for the pillows. They have tons of options to choose from. This terry cloth would be nice if you don't want a high pile fabric. Or you could go for a more velvety option with this short pile fur. And right as I was about to settle on that one, there it was. A look at all those beautiful textures and furs. That's the one. It's a faux shirling and looks pretty darn close to the Pottery Barn version. Isn't it stunning? And I love how the shirling is only on one side. While I was waiting for the girl to cut the fabric, there was a basket of this E6000 Fabric Fusion Glue. I've never seen this before, but I love E6000 and thought we should give it a try. Now to make the pillow, I grabbed a Dollar Tree heart-shaped sign to use as a template, but I wanted the pillow to be a little bit bigger than the sign. So I used my fabric roller and marked out an additional two inches and then drew a line and cut out my heart. Next, I pinned the heart to another section of the fabric to make sure I cut them both the same size. So I didn't think the V in the middle of the heart was quite deep enough. I thought by the time I turned the pillow inside out, you wouldn't be able to tell it's a heart. So I cut the V a little bit deeper, but I think if I had left it, it would have looked a little bit more like the Pottery Barn one. Now we can use the fabric glue to attach the two sides. The instructions say to add the glue to both sides and then join them together. So I added a line of glue about a quarter of an inch in from the edge on both hearts. You want to make sure you leave a section with no glue to turn it inside out later. I forgot about that part at first and had to wipe some of that glue off. Then you want to set it aside to dry for at least eight hours. Let me tell you, I was pleasantly surprised at how strong this glue was when I tried to pull it apart the next day. Well, maybe I shouldn't say I was surprised because E6000 is a wonderful adhesive. I highly recommend this product if you need to attach fabric and don't have a sewing machine. Next, you wanna turn the pillow right side out and then fill it with stuffing. I use polyfill and you can make it as full as you want. Just make sure you stuff it against all of the seams really well. Then you just need to seal up the opening. I folded the edges in a bit and used my hot glue to close it up. Now, because of the way this fabric is with the high pile and how I glued it rather than sewed it, the seams are not as fluffy. The glue was on top of that pile, so it just pulled at it when I flipped it inside out, but that's it for this pillow. However, I also wanted to show you that you can make this using Dollar Tree materials as well. I went to Dollar Tree looking for the fluffy white car towels, and of course my store didn't have any. I only had one at home, which wasn't enough for this project, but I actually think they stopped selling the white car towels and upgraded to these ShamWow looking ones. They probably work better on cars, but sad for us crafters. Anyways, I looked around and saw these fluffy white mop pads, so I grabbed four of them. I thought I could glue two together and then cut it out in the heart shape. Let me tell you, this stuff made an absolute mess. There were white strings all over me, all over the place after I cut it out, but I carried on and glued the two hearts together. This time I glued the back sides together because I figured these were so fluffy that they would hide the seam. 
but once the glue was dry and I started to stuff the little pillow, you could see the gaps between the fluffy sections. There was a hole at the top and a big gap where I had glued those two bot pads together. Now, I don't give up on projects easily, but I figured I already had one pillow and didn't need this one. But you could always use something else from the Dollar Tree, like their bathroom hand towels or bath mats to get a similar look. So the Pottery Barn Heart Pillow cost about $50. My version cost $15 for the fabric and the glue. I'm taking these six inch dowels from the Dollar Tree, so they're the smaller size ones, and I'm going to again use my T-square and we are going to make a square. I wanna make sure that everything is all nice and straight and my angles are perfectly 90 degrees. And I don't, I didn't think about it at first, but I should have made two squares and then glued in the side pieces because we're gonna be making a box or a cube, whatever you wanna call it. But I, that was an afterthought and I didn't think about it at first. <laughs> I wasn't planning on making it an actual box. I just wanted the side pieces for structure, but I ended up needing the top as well. Now I'm just gonna add in all of the side pieces. Again, using my square just to make sure everything is nice and straight. And here's what the piece should look like when it's all complete. So you can see how those two I have, they're kind of sticking up rather than being flush. And that's why I should have created two squares and then added those center posts. So next I'm gonna take some burlap fabric that I got from a girl who after her wedding, she just didn't want these anymore. She had 20 table runners and I got them all from her. So I'm gonna have plenty of this to work with for a long time. But I'm just gonna glue it right up against this edge. This is where I cut it, so I cut them maybe like a third of the table runner. I wanted to wrap around this square two times. Then I'm just gonna cut that raw edge off so that it's nice and flush against the dowel. And I make sure that the seam, um, the finished seam along the bottom is right up against that bottom dial, dowel, but covering it. And on this first layer of burlap, I wanna make it pretty tight. So I wanna make sure it's pretty secure around there. After I have that first layer down, the next one I'm just going to glue down the bottom of it because I want it to have that slouchy look. Definitely make sure to use something other than your fingers to pull, push it down because that hot glue seeps right through the burlap. And then when you get to the end, I made sure that that finished seam was on the outside and I just pushed it right up against that corner. Next, I'm taking the part that was hanging over above the cube and I'm gonna fold it down two times, making sure that those corners do come over top of the dowel. So you can see I'm gonna pull it down here just to make sure that it's all nice and snug. But just don't push too hard because you definitely don't wanna break this box. It's only held on with that hot glue. And the last thing I'm gonna do is just take some yarn that I have from the Dollar Tree. You could use any color you want. You could do this in any design or any pattern that you want, but I just added in some horizontal rows or lines and I just added them wherever I thought it looked nice. I did this all the way around all four sides and then all the way up until you got to that folded over edge. So I just didn't do anything on the fold. And I love the way this turned out. Again, this is something that could fit into several different home decor styles. I'm not really into farmhouse, but it would definitely fit that theme or that decor style as well.
this was super simple and super quick and easy to do like I said you could do any design or pattern you wanted to here so here's the inspiration it was from a company called River City for $25 and mine cost $5 to make this modern stole I made over about a year ago and I'll link the original videos in my description box for my for more upcycled stole ideas. I love the dark base on this stole but wanted to give it more of a layered and chippy look so I'm gonna take my moss green paint and add some areas of green. Very sporadic, I don't want anything to look uniform or even look good at this point. Once the green paint is dry, I sprayed the stool with a coat of this satin polyurethane. I'm going to add milk paint to get that chippy look and you want to have a slick surface. Now for the milk paint, I'm using the color Driftwood, which is a beautiful chocolatey brown. And I found this milk paint at a local woodworking shop called Woodcraft. A lot of creators use the Sweet Pickens milk paint, but I can't find that in my area. So if you're in a similar situation, try looking for a wood shop. But to mix milk paint, you wanna take one part of the powder to two thirds hot water. I like it a little bit thinner. They also say to use warm water, but I find hot water works better to dissolve the powder. You wanna mix it up really well for two minutes and then let the paint sit for about 10 minutes to let that powder fully absorb. I put two coats of the milk paint on only the bottom part of the stool, nothing on the top just yet, and I used my heat gun to help accelerate the drying, which also helps get that chippy look. Since there were some areas of the paint that were really chipped, I took a scraper to get those loose areas off and started revealing the layers underneath. This is only my second time using milk paint, and I will say I think it turns out much nicer when you have multiple layers of paint with a few different colors. I love the way that this turned out. Once I got all the large chipped areas off, I took my sandpaper to smooth it out. And if you don't want the paint to continue chipping over time, seal it up now. I didn't seal it up because I want to see how this will continue to age. Now for the top of the stool, I got out my drop cloth fabric and wanted to stamp it. I love the idea of it having a romantic script look covering the fabric and I got this stamp recently from IOD which was perfect. I stamped it up with my black ink and then applied it to the fabric. I didn't add the full stamp because I wanted it to look like a continuous message across the whole top. I didn't want to use the very top or the bottom of the stamp. You can see there's some areas where there are a large gap between the words, so I did fill those in with some small words like the or of. If anyone were to actually read this, it would not make any sense, but I'm okay with that. This is more about the aesthetic. Once I was done stamping the fabric, I need to add it on top of the stool. This stool was originally just a flat wood on top, but I want there to be a cushion. And I have this two inch high density foam left over from another project, so I cut out a rectangle to fit on top. I did not glue it down to the wood, but I probably should have. To attach the fabric on top, I'm using my stapler and then tacked it down. And for the corners, I folded them to have a clean straight tuck right on the edge. I was going to leave the stool like this, but thought it needed something more around the sides. I've been seeing fabric roses on my Pinterest feed and thought that would add to that overall romantic feel I was going for. Making the roses is super easy. You take a strip of fabric. You can ignore the stamps I had on this fabric. I was testing out some ink colors, but you want a roughly two inch wide section. I didn't measure anything here and then tie a knot at the end. The longer your fabric strip is, the larger your rose will be. Then you just wanna start twisting the fabric and wrap it around the knot, hot gluing it down as you go.
These roses are so adorable. I made 30 of them to go around the stool and then hot glued them down around the bottom edge. That's it for this one. I love this version of the stool so much better. this project I found this flagstone slate looking piece at one of my local thrift stores it was $7.99 which was kind of on the pricey side but I thought it was really unique and I could find something really cool to do with it I also found this jacket at my local Goodwill and again I loved the texture and I just knew I could do something cool with it so I picked that up as well and I'm gonna start cutting it down to fit in the center of my slate piece and I actually found this idea from Julie's Designs and Signs. She did something very similar recently. I will link her video in my description box where she cut out, it was either burlap or drop cloth fabric that she used and stamped it. And I just thought it was so cool. So I wanted to do something similar with a bit more of a modern take. So now I'm gonna take you guys through how I use my Cricut design space. I know several of you have been asking for a tutorial on how I use this. So I opened up my, my Cricut design space and I clicked on new project. And then I clicked on the image button on the left hand side. And there are tons of preloaded images that you can find on the Cricut design space. I do pay for Cricut access. So anything with that A there, I do have access to and pay a monthly subscription for. But for this piece, I wanted to find some type of like greenery stem. So I just typed in the word stem and I'm scrolling through all of the images that pop up until I find something that I like. And I really love this simple, modern looking greenery piece. So I clicked on that and then hit insert onto my project. And it's gonna take me back to my project screen here. And I apologize. For some reason, the record screen was not working on my computer, so I had to literally film with my phone, but you still get the idea. Next, I'm clicking on the shapes, and I want to bring in a square. We're going to change the size of this, so I unlock it down in that left-hand corner, and then I'm going to change the width and the height to be the size of my black fabric piece that we cut out so that I know how big I want this Cricut cutout to be and where it's going to sit on my fabric piece. Then I'm just bringing my image to the front. I just right clicked on it and hit bring to front so that it would be on top of my square here. And I'm going to enlarge it until I am happy with the way this looks and the way that it is going to sit on my fabric. Once I'm happy with the size of my greenery fern here, I'm just going to delete that square background. We don't actually want to print out that part of this image, only the greenery itself. And then I'm gonna click up on the right hand side there where it says make it. Now it's gonna bring us to this screen telling us how many mats this is separated into. This was a layered image, so it is separated onto two different mats with two different cuts. I was okay with that, and it tells me I need a 12 by 12 inch mat to cut out this piece. So I'm satisfied with that, and I click continue, and it's going to connect to my Cricut machine through the Bluetooth, and it's going to set my base material. So I have mine currently set at vinyl, on, I have the Cricut Explore Air 2, which if you need to change the setting, you turn the knob on the machine itself. But mine is set to vinyl, so we are good to go. Now we go over to the Cricut. You can see the flashing arrows. It is telling me to feed my mat into my Cricut machine, and I hit the arrow to feed my mat. Now it's going to light up the little C button. We are going to press that and that is going to cut out our vinyl. Now, if you have been following me for a while, you know that I love to use Dollar Tree contact paper anytime I am cutting out a stencil. I don't like to waste vinyl. I feel like vinyl is too expensive for that. But if you have stencil vinyl or you prefer to cut out actual vinyl when creating a stencil, by all means, do what makes you happy. When your cut is complete, you will see that arrow again flashing for you. You're gonna press it, it is going to unload your mat, and then you can take it out of the machine and start weeding. 
This is such a satisfying part to me. I know other people love watching weeding or weeding themselves and there are others who absolutely hate it and dread this process, but I actually think it is quite soothing and relaxing. Once I have my stencil out, again, I like to use cheap contact paper, clear contact paper as my transfer tape, and I'm just going to lay it down. I use actually the Target brand clear contact paper as my transfer tape, and then I start removing the backing, and this sometimes doesn't want to come up all the way. I just go slowly, push it back down, and then roll it to remove the backing of my contact paper. Once I have that removed, I am going to place it down on my fabric where I want this stencil to go, remove that clear contact paper, and then we are going to start adding the paint to our stencil. So since this was a layered image, it cut out the full greenery piece as one large section, and then there is a smaller section that kind of layers on top of it. So I wanted the bottom layer that was this full piece of greenery to be in the gray mineral color. And once I'm done stamping that, you'll see in a second here, I have to add on that second layer and then we're going to add the color there. And I do use my heat tool to dry my paint in between. I added two layers or two coats of my paint, removed the vinyl, or the contact paper and then moved on to my second layer. You can see me struggling here. It was really sticky, this contact paper. Normally I like de-stick it a little bit, stick it to my shirt, but I didn't do that this time and it was really sticking to this fabric and did not want to come off. So now I need to add that second layer and I'm just going to line it up as best as I can right over top of that first section and I was okay if it kind of showed the gray underneath of it a little bit. I thought it would give a really cool like shadow effect almost and then I am taking my ivory colored chalk paint and stamping this one. Again I gave it two coats of paint and dried it with my heat gun in between. Once my stencil was all finished I'm gonna take my Mod Podge and add this fabric to the slate. Now, I think I should have used a spray adhesive here instead of the Mod Podge. I didn't like how the Mod Podge turned my fabric more shiny. Even though this is a matte, matte Mod Podge, it still does have a slight sheen to it. So if I were doing this again, I would definitely use a spray adhesive instead of the Mod Podge. But once it was dry, I just took some two millimeter macrame cord and I wanted to outline the raw edges to cover those up a little bit around the fabric. Hot glued that down and that was it for this one. I absolutely love the way this turned out. I think it is super modern and minimal and just my style. I'm starting out with this frame, which I picked up from Habitat for Humanity probably about a year ago and had turned it into a display shelf, but I'm no longer using the shelf and wanted to repurpose this. If you wanna see how I created the original shelf, I will link that video in the description below. But the frame is 17 inches by 14 inches and I'm cutting down a piece of foam core board to be my backing. Next, I bought this chunky sweater from the Goodwill and cut out the back of it. This is going to be the background and I just love the texture and cozy vibe that this adds. To attach the sweater, I'm using my Gorilla hot glue and to make sure I got the sweater to look straight, I took one of the straight lines on the knit and used that as my guide. So after gluing the bottom, I went to the top. That way I didn't end up stretching out one side more than another. And it was careful not to pull the sweater too taut to shift the pattern on the front of it. Once all of the sides were glued down, I cut off the excess and glued the frame on top.
Now to add the detail, I had this almost perfectly sized scrap piece of leather and just cut it down slightly so it measures 12 inches by four inches. But I didn't really care for the color, so I'm taking several different paint colors and a sponge and just experimenting, playing around until I get the look I'm after. Next, I cut out the word believe with my Cricut and I used the font agency FB. I'm going to use this as a stencil. I like using Dollar Tree contact paper to make my stencils to keep the cost low for something I'm just going to throw away. I always forget to make sure there's a border around stencils. So no surprise here, I forgot to do that. Learn from my mistakes. Make sure you add a rectangle, a circle, a square, whatever the shape of your stencil cutout is going to be. I ended up having to add some painter's tape so that I wouldn't get the paint on my leather where I didn't want it. Oh my gosh, you guys. Next, I made such a mess. I forgot I had already opened the lid of my black paint, picked it up to shake it, and yeah, I'm sure you can guess what happened next. It went all over my project, my hand, my craft mat, what a mess. But I recovered, cleaned it up, added the black paint to my stencil using a sponge dabber. And then after I added the stencil, I went back and fixed the part of my leather where the black paint had spilled on it and it looks good as new. Nothing ever happened here. Now we just need to attach the leather to the sweater. I used my hot glue again for this. and added one last detail with these nail head trim pieces I had on hand to each corner, and that was it for this one. If you couldn't tell by my last two Christmas videos that I have posted so far this season, I am going for a very cozy, natural materials, Scandinavian neutral vibe this Christmas, and I'm absolutely loving it. Mushroom decor is everywhere right now, and at first I didn't really care for this trend, but the more I saw it, the more I started to love it. This project, I was looking at this Dollar Tree hanging basket, and again I thought I can use that as a mushroom cap, but what do I use for the stipe? First I removed the chain, and if you recreate this one, cut off those pieces that connect the chain as well, I wasn't sure how I was going to do this one at first and I left them on, but I do cut them off later. Velvet textures are everywhere right now and I've had this Ikea pillow cover in my stash for a while. It's the perfect amount of fabric for this project. I first cut open the pillowcase so it was one sheet. Next, I wanted there to be some detail on the mushroom cap and didn't wanna just wrap the outside with it. So of course I made things difficult and cut out triangle pieces that were a little bit bigger than the spaces between each wire. Then I'm gonna start adding them onto the hanging basket. I'm just using hot glue here and I wrap the very top of the piece of triangle around the inner circle to attach it. 
Then glued the edges along the wire, but I did not glue the bottom on just yet. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky. I glued the top of the next triangle on the same way. And then I wanted there to be a raw edge seam along where that wire section is. So I had to flip the edges up and glue them together. I did this bit by bit to make sure it flowed along the wire nicely. This first one was easy, but as I kept going, some of the sections were a little bit more difficult than others, trying to get those outside edges to look good and relatively cohesive, but I think it turned out pretty good. Once I had all the panels on, I trimmed up the raw edges so they were pretty even and stood up how I wanted them to. Then I wrapped the bottom of the fabric onto the inside and glued it down. This is where I realized I wasn't sure what I was doing with those pieces that connected the chain. I still left them on for now and glued the fabric around them, but it looked kinda silly. Now, to cover the open circle on top, I grabbed a wood ring and a scrap piece of the fabric to cover it. The fabric scrap barely fit, but I somehow made it work and then glued that on top. Okay, now that the top is done, I need to figure out the bottom. I found this vase in my craft room that was a good shape and wrapped it with the second half of the fabric pillowcase. I'm sure there was a much better way to wrap this, but I kind of made it difficult. I thought I had pulled it tight, but somehow ended up with a loose section where the seam is on the back. I thought it was gonna be a hot mess, but I glued it down to look somewhat decent. For the top of the vase, I wasn't even going to attempt to make this look smooth, so I just gathered all the fabric together and put a rubber band around it. This part will be hidden by the top, so I wasn't worried about it. This vase wasn't quite tall enough for the look I wanted, so I added a few popsicle sticks to the top and then a few Jenga blocks on top of that to add some height. That was it for this one. I'm not sure if I love it, but it's all right. I think it would be really cute turned into a lamp. shutter which I actually found on the side of the road. I have four sets of them and I've slowly been working away at using them in my projects but I just sanded it down, gave it a nice fresh coat of spray paint and then I'm taking this burlap fabric that I have on hand, cutting it down to the length that I want it to be to cover the bottom half of my shutter. Then I'm going to just rip out a few of the threads from the burlap fabric. I love this look for the fall. It adds just that perfect little rustic touch. 
Next, we're heading over to the printer. I found these pumpkins and spelled out harvest on my Cricut, but I want to just print it out on my printer using this Hippo transfer paper. Hippo is kind enough to sponsor today's video. I am super excited to be working with them. Now, I know that this paper says that it is for dark fabrics, but I did put it to the test. I didn't show it in this video, but I did put it to the test with white fabric as well, and you can use it on both dark and white fabrics. Another thing that I thought was really cool about this paper is you can actually have your kids draw a picture or you could even paint something yourself and you can then transfer it on to a t-shirt or a bag or whatever you want to add it to so that you can have that image forever. I thought this was really awesome and I definitely want to try this out. So once I pulled my image from Cricut that I found into my Word document then i want to print it out and you want to go into your print properties here and you want to make sure that you are selecting photo paper and high gloss and make sure that you have it set to color for the best quality you also want to make sure you print on the white side of the paper and not on the grid side which is the backing you will end up peeling off Next, I'm going to cut out my image that I printed out. Now you can use a Cricut if you have one with this paper. I chose not to. I wanted to cut out, well actually I didn't really know how I could get this image then back into my Cricut. I don't know how to print something like this, but anyways, that's a whole nother story. I wanted to cut out each individual letter because I really wanted that burlap fabric to show through underneath and I didn't want to have like any white border around it. So this certainly was a little bit time consuming, but if you wanted to cut out an image on your Cricut, you certainly could. Now to transfer or iron the letters down onto my burlap. If you have an easy press or a heat press or anything like that, it would work just the same. I don't have any of those things, so I'm just going to be using my good old fashioned iron here. So I place my letters down where I want them to go. I did this one by one so that I could have more control over the placement. Then I laid down the I think it's, I forget what it's called, but it's basically wax paper that comes in your little package from Hippo. And then you want to heat up the paper for about two minutes. And then I found what was best was to let the wax paper cool down slightly before peeling it off. And that worked out really well. So next I'm just going to lay down my pumpkins and do the same exact thing. I really love the way that this image transferred onto the burlap. You can really see that texture coming through underneath as if this were painted right onto the fabric and I love it. So now I'm going to take my burlap and wrap it around the bottom of my shutter using my finger protector because that hot glue will come right through all of those little holes in your burlap. Then I added some of this farmhouse ribbon that I got from the Dollar Tree to both the top and the bottom of my burlap, leaving a little bit of the burlap on either end of it, added in some dried florals, stuck it on my front porch, and this is part of my fall decor. I got this bread box it was from the goodwill for $4.99 and um, it just opens up there is a little crack on the inside of it where the bottom of it would have been nothing that we can't fix so I took it out to my garage gave it a good scuff sand and this image on it was actually like a raised image if you rubbed your hand across it. So I had to sand that part down really well or else you would have seen it through the paint once we painted it. So to fix that little crack, I'm just using my medium Starbond glue along with an accelerator. This is not the Starbond accelerator, but it works just the same. So I'm just going to fill in this crack and then I dropped my camera when spraying the accelerator so I didn't get that part but you just spray it on and it instantly hardens. Next I took this lightweight spackle from the Dollar Tree just to smooth out those cracks so that it wouldn't still be visible. 
I took some 220 grit sandpaper, sanded that down, and then using my little handy dandy tabletop vacuum, cleaned that all up. And I will link him in my description box below. So to paint this, I am using my moss colored Waverly chalk paint. I did paint the entire outside and then the, the lid, both the inside and the outside of the lid in this color, giving it two coats. I did not paint the inside because we're going to do something different there. So I found this adhesive stencil vinyl at Michael's. It was on clearance, so I picked it up. I'd wanted to try something like this. I could tell as soon as I opened this, it was going to be a mistake. Like, just look at those wrinkles. I did try to smooth them out with my little, um, why can't I think of that? Like that little brayer tool <laughs> scraper from Cricut. And I lifted it up off of the surface and tried to smooth it back down the best I could. My machine just ate this thing up. I didn't get a clip of that, but don't buy this stuff. Off the mat and it ripped off part of my backer. So I'm going to go ahead and say this is a fail of a product and no wonder it was on clearance. So instead I went back to my Dollar Tree contact paper. This is what I like to use whenever I'm printing out a stencil on my Cricut because I'm just going to end up throwing it away and I don't want to use expensive vinyl. So I cut out this little paw print and then my dog's name, which is Sarge, because we are turning this little bread box into a dog toy box. So stinking cute. But I've had some people ask me to share my design space process um, using my Cricut. If anyone else is interested in that, let me know. I'm happy to create that for you guys. I'm not a Cricut affiliate, so I just haven't made a video dedicated to my like Cricut design space yet, but I can certainly do that. Just let me know if anyone else is interested in seeing it. Using my makeup sponge, I added two thin layers of white chalk paint to um, my stencil and then used my heat tool to dry it and lifted it off. And how cute. I just love his little name at the bottom right corner of his toy box. <music> paw prints I am placing those on the inside of the lid so I'm using this a little bit different I'm having the lid actually be like the top of how the box opens and you'll see that here in just a minute so to fill the inside I decided I wanted to use some fabric to line it with I had this fabric left over from my bench in my living room I'll insert a picture of that for you guys to see but I thought it would be a perfect accent for the inside of his box and knowing that he's going to be putting his toy like pulling his toys out of it I'll be putting them back in but that he'll be pulling them out of it all the time I wanted something that would hold up and didn't want to just put paint so I am using some decoupage glue this is a terrible angle so I didn't film too much of this part of the project but you can get the idea I just decoupage mod podge whatever you want to use I added this fabric down, cut off anything that was extra, and this I think is going to hold up really nicely with some wear and tear from a dog. So here is how it turned out, and I just think this is absolutely adorable. I had been looking for a bread box to make over for a while now, and I'm so happy I found one, but I do have a true bread box in my kitchen, so I wanted to turn it into something else. Sarge, what's in here? Is that your toys? Do you like it? What's in there? Yeah, get your toys. Which one are you gonna pick? Oh, oh, one on the bottom. Do you pick the raccoon? You got your raccoon? <laughs> Hard to film. Oh. Tug of war, huh? Yeah. It's hard to film. He is just so handsome. Our next piece, I am taking these frame inspiration images and I'm going to take some frames that I had laying around at home. This one is just blank and then another one is a Marilyn Monroe um, film strip that my husband bought me while we were dating and I thought I'd jazz it up a little bit. So I got these fat quarters from Walmart. They come in a pack of five and they're about six dollars. Such a great deal. So I'm going to use one blue set and one black and gold set for each of my frames. 
So I just took my uh, L roller, whatever this is called, <laughs> I forget the name of it, and I'm just gonna make sure that I have enough fabric that it's going to fold all the way around my frame on like the inside, outside, and then like around to the back. So I use this as kind of like a guide for how big it needed to be and just cut out that piece. Then I cut out a center for the center of our picture frame. And I don't know if this was the best way to go about doing the center portion or not. Um, feel free to let me know if there would have been an easier option. I don't know how easy this was. I'm sure there was a better way to do it. But anyways, I'm taking some Mod Podge and I'm smothering it all over my frame everywhere that I want my fabric to lay so that it sticks nice and tight to the frame. And then I'm just going to rub everything down with the Mod Podge underneath and you can kind of feel it start to come through. Um, at the corners I just kind of like pinched everything together till it came to a nice point and I didn't um, do anything with the corners just yet. I actually did both of these frames a little bit different on the corners because I really wasn't sure what was going to work best. Um, but I'll show you here in a second what I do on the black one. So I just got those corners nice and tight and then I just cut them as close as I could and then made sure that the fabric laid flat um, and you really couldn't tell that they were, I don't know, I guess it looked fine, I don't know. Anyways, then I'm taking my Mod Podge again and we're going all over the top of the fabric to make sure that it is nice and adhered to our frames. And that's it. This one was so easy, but such a beautiful upgrade to these frames and an easy way to get that look from the inspiration image. Let's see how it looks. Looks a lot better than it did. Yeah, I fun. like it. Personality. I think it looks good. You're recording that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so needless to say, the hubby approved of this upgrade. And I said mine cost about $3 just in case you had to buy the fabric. But again, I had all of these materials on hand already. But I love the way this turned out. I think this blue one really gives off the same vibe as that tiled inspiration image. Next up, I have this beautiful basket. I believe I found this one at the Goodwill bins and I had several ideas of what I wanted to do with it. I started out wanting to paint a green sack stripe on the top. I found another new color by Waverly at my Walmart called Sandstone. Does anyone else still have Waverly paint in their stores? I know so many content creators can no longer buy Waverly starting about a year ago, but my store has been coming out with new colors. I don't know why they're not consistent, but happy that I can still buy it. Anyways, after I painted three stripes on, I really didn't like it. So I did my best to remove the paint with water. I couldn't get into all the nooks and crannies. So I got what I could off and then took some watered down sandstone paint and brushed it over the entire basket to blend it in. Now I wanted to try printing on fabric and adding it to the basket. This was such an easy process. I took a piece of computer paper and this Gorilla adhesive spray, sprayed the paper, and then put a piece of canvas drop cloth on top of the paper. You wanna make sure you smooth the fabric out really well so there's no wrinkles or lumps. Then I did a rough cut around the paper with scissors to cut off the excess fabric, but also went back in with my rotary blade to cut right along the edge of the paper. Then you can stick it into the printer and print out your design. I found this image on Etsy from a shop called Graphique. I did pay $1 for the digital download and I'll link the shop in my description box if you're interested in this design, but this shop also has tons of beautiful graphics you can choose from. After my image was printed, I'm removing it from the paper and the adhesive did not make the fabric sticky whatsoever. I definitely thought that it would, but then I cut it down to the size I wanted for the front of my basket. I pulled a few of the loose threads around the edges to add some more detail and an aged look and then I hot glued the fabric onto the basket. Next, to give the whole basket an even more of an aged look, I took my DIY dark wax and brushed it all around the basket including over the edges of the fabric. 
For a final detail, I'm adding these brass tacks to the corners. I did cut the tack piece off of the backs and just glued them down. That's it for this one. I added some lavender and love the way this looks. Friends, I always forget to mention this, but I do have a website where I sell some of my DIY projects and thrifted finds. I only list what I think is going to ship and hold up well over time, but the link is always in my description box in case you're interested.